out of the chaos, darkness and violence of the Middle Ages, one family rose to seize control of England. Generation after generation, they ruled the country for more than 300 years, ruthlessly crushing all competition to become the greatest English dynasty of all time. The Plantagenets. What I love about the Plantagenet story is that it's more shocking, more brutal, and more astonishing than anything you'll find in fiction. I want to show you the Plantagenets as I see them. Real, living, breathing people. Driven by ambition, jealousy, hatred, and revenge. These kings murdered, betrayed, and tyrannized their way to spectacular success. For better and for worse, the Plantagenets forged England as a nation. This time, Edward II was the king most famous for the story of his agonizing death. But the story of his life is even more extraordinary. One of obsession, bloodlust, political savagery, and above all, revenge. July the 11th, 1307, Prince Edward, the 20-year-old heir to the throne, is near London as word of his father's death races south to meet him. Monseigneur, Dora est mort. This is the news that Prince Edward's been waiting for all his life. So the very first thing you'd expect him to do is to saddle up, ride north, claim his birthright and save his country. But he doesn't. In fact, the first thing he does is to issue orders for the recall of the most divisive man in the kingdom. On voit la nouvelle France. Faites retourner mon frère Gaviston. Gaveston, Edward's best friend and one of the finest knights around. But he's been banished to France by the old king for being a bad influence on the prince. Gaveston's insufferable arrogance and his hold over Edward mean he's hated by every noble in the land. Gaveston doesn't have much time for them either. He's famous for making up rude nicknames for them. He calls one Horson, another Burst Belly, and a third the Black Dog. And of course, that just makes them hate him even more. Gaveston's return will clearly be nothing but trouble, but Edward can't see it. All he cares about is getting his mate back. Edward is the sort of guy who can only see one step ahead. He wants what he wants now, no matter what the cost. He's utterly incapable of seeing that all his actions have consequences, most of them bad ones. This blindness will ultimately lead both Edward and his kingdom to ruin. And disaster looms right from the start. Edward marries 12-year-old Isabella, daughter of the King of France, a match designed to shore up relations with the kingdom's biggest enemy. 
their joint coronation should be a moment of triumph and unity. But it isn't. This is the Great Hall at the Palace of Westminster, where Edward and Isabella's coronation feast takes place. There's lavish decorations, fountains flowing with wine, but there's one problem. This looks less like a coronation feast for Edward and his queen, and more like a party for Edward and Gaveston. Edward and Isabella's coats of arms should be on the walls. Instead, it's Edward and Gaveston's. Worse, Gaveston swans around in imperial purple, a colour only kings should wear. Worse still, the king and his friend talk to no one but each other throughout. Isabella is stoic, but the rest of the French nobles are so incensed they storm out. With them goes all the goodwill the marriage was designed to create. The English nobles are hacked off too. Not least Edward's cousin, Thomas of Lancaster, the most powerful earl in England. Lancaster hates Gaveston, and to him the whole event is an outrage. It's proof Edward can't see past his obsession with his friend to the far more important job of being king. And if Edward can't see it, then Lancaster's going to make him see it. Just three months later, at Edward's first parliament, Lancaster and a group of other leading nobles turn up, armed. Their message to Edward is simple. Gaveston must go. Edward responds by accusing them of treachery. He gets a chilling reply. Notre loyauté avec le fils du roi, et non pas avec lui qui tient cet office. It's an explicit threat. If you don't get rid of him, we'll get rid of you. But whatever Lancaster threatens him with, on Gaveston, Edward won't budge. And Lancaster can't make him. Yet. But the battle lines have been drawn. The bitter hatred between Edward and his cousin and this fight over Gaveston will define the whole future of the kingdom and bloody murder will now stalk England for the rest of Edward's reign. Gaveston's help, Edward has very quickly run the country into the ground. The finances, security and political stability have all gone to the dogs. By 1310, Lancaster's patience is exhausted. He comes up with a plan to tear Edward and Gaveston apart. Lancaster's been conducting a whispering campaign against the king, using popular hatred of Gaveston to help sell his case. He claims that Gaveston's been lining his pockets at the king's expense. Now, annoying as Gaveston is, that's probably one of the few things he hasn't been doing. But the mud sticks, and by February 1310, Lancaster has a committed group of nobles ready to stand up to the king, and that allows him to do something extraordinary. And the evidence exists here, in the National Archives. He's going to crush Edward and destroy Gaveston at the same time. These are the ordinances, 41 articles which Lancaster claims will bring stability and reform to the kingdom. Sounds great, but taken as a whole, they actually do something very different. They strip Edward of pretty much all his powers as king. It's an unprecedented attack. 
The ordinances take away the king's right to impose taxation, raise armies, dispense justice and make law. All these rights will now rest with the nobles and Lancaster will be far more powerful than the king. But even that's not enough for Lancaster, because this is personal, and there's a clause here that proves it. It's not to do with rights or laws. It's to do with Gaveston. This is it, Clause 20. It's even got Gaveston's name beside it. It says he has malmené, misled, and mal conseillé, ill counselled, nostre seigneur le roi, our lord the king. It orders his immediate exile. Also says that if Gaveston returns, he is to be treated as a traitor. And the penalty for traitors is death. So what does Edward do? He should fight Lancaster to protect his basic rights as king, but he doesn't. He seems perfectly happy to let his enemies strip away his right to make peace or war, to dispense justice, to collect taxation, so long as they drop Clause 20 and leave his mate alone. But Lancaster has Edward over a barrel. If he doesn't agree to all the ordinances, then Lancaster and his new allies will go to war against him. The king has no choice. He turns his back on his friend. He accepts the ordinances and Gaveston is banished. Forever. On pain of death. It beggars belief that Edward would be willing to give up all his power just to save his friend. That's led people to suspect that Edward and Gaveston were more than just friends. That they were lovers. And that Edward's desire for Gaveston outweighed everything else. So is it true? Well, possibly. I don't think we'll ever really know what went on behind the closed doors of the royal bedchamber, but frankly, it didn't really matter. To the people of the time, Edward could have been bedding his priest, his page boy, and his horse, so long as he was governing the kingdom properly. To the nobles' minds, Gaveston stopped Edward from doing that, and that's why Gaveston had to go. Lancaster may think he's finally got the king under control, but he hasn't, because when it comes to Gaveston, Edward is literally a law unto himself. Just three months later, defying Lancaster and all sense, Edward calls Gaveston back, again. And if that wasn't crazy enough, what Edward does next is utter insanity. The king sends letters out across the country announcing Gaveston's return and adding that he's overturning the ordinances. All of them. When Edward's letters read out in town squares like this, it does two things. First, it brings England to the brink of civil war, and second, it paints a pretty big target on Gaveston's back. So you'd be forgiven for thinking this is just the start of some much bigger plan. But you'd be wrong, because actually, this is the plan. Edward's just going to overturn the ordinances and see what happens. And that's Edward all over. He's so fixated on what he wants today, he simply can't see what's obviously going to happen next. Lancaster's response is no surprise to anyone except the king. Gaveston is hunted down and brought here to Warwick Castle, home of one of Lancaster's allies. The next day, he's hauled up in front of a court organised by Lancaster. It's composed entirely of nobles who detest him. Gaveston isn't even allowed to speak in his defence. It's a kangaroo court pure and simple. Make no mistake, Lancaster's crossing a line here. He's trying Gaveston under Article 20 of the Ordinances, which make it very clear. 
If Gaveston comes back to England, he dies. Problem is, Edward's overturned the ordinances, so this court held here at Warwick Castle has about as much authority as a lynch mob. Piers Gaveston, best friend and trusted advisor to the King of England, is convicted of treason and sentenced to death. But however they want to dress it up, this isn't justice, it's political murder. On the 19th of June, 1312, Lancaster's men marched Piers Gaveston out of Warwick Castle all the way to Blacklow Hill for execution. This monument marks the lonely spot where Gaveston was killed. He's brought here because unlike Warwick Castle, this land belongs to Lancaster and he wants to send the king a message. He wants him to know who's doing this to him. This is personal. When Edward hears about Gaveston's death, he goes half crazy with grief. First, he blames Gaveston for getting caught. Then, more reasonably, he blames Lancaster. Interestingly, the only person he doesn't blame is himself. But he's the one who brought Gaveston back again and again, despite being warned very clearly what would happen if he did. He's the one who put his friend in danger. He might not want to admit it, but the buck stops with him. Edward swears revenge on Lancaster. But with the ordinances reissued and everyone against him, the king is in no position to revenge himself on anyone. And things are about to get even worse. Edward's been neglecting the never-ending war with Scotland. By 1314, it's reached crisis point. He has to march an army north immediately or the war will be lost. Now, for Edward, this is actually an opportunity. Winning in Scotland could really help turn things around for him. But as ever, disaster is about to strike. And as ever, Edward can't see it coming. In the crucial battle that decides the war, Edward's army is massacred. And it's all Lancaster's fault. When Edward led his troops to Scotland, Lancaster was legally obliged to bring his forces to support him. The last thing Lancaster wants is to see Edward succeed. So when the time came to march north, Lancaster and his cronies simply didn't turn up. The king suffers a historic defeat. Most of his army are slaughtered. Edward is lucky to escape with his life. And there is now only one thing in his mind. He will do absolutely anything to get revenge on Lancaster. After Bannockburn, Edward is humiliated, financially ruined and friendless. He desperately needs strong new allies to help him. And here at Caerphilly Castle, in the wild west of medieval Britain, is where he finds them. They're called the Dispensers. This castle tells you everything you need to know about the dispensers. In a place where neighbours are constantly at war over money and power, the dispensers have the biggest, baddest castle of them all.
There are two of them, both called Hugh. Dad is a long-time supporter of Edward, but it's his son who's the driving force. Hugh Dispenser Jr. is as ruthless as he is ambitious. He's not afraid to take on anyone, and he's got the brains and muscle to back it up. The dispensers help Edward drag himself out of the mire, restoring the royal finances and getting the country up and running again. In return, they get to do whatever the hell they like. As soon as they've gained the king's confidence, the dispensers start snatching things for themselves. Over the next three years, they grab territory after territory in the Welsh borders, trampling on anyone who gets in their way. Edward must realise the dispensers are massively destabilising the balance of power in the kingdom. And it must be obvious they're only out for themselves. But I think as long as they ultimately serve up revenge on Lancaster, he doesn't care who they upset in the process. He can't see how the effects of the dispenser's Welsh power grab could possibly turn out badly for him. But it does, because Edward backing the dispensers creates a new and very dangerous enemy. Roger Mortimer, one of the most powerful barons in the kingdom. Up to this point, he's actually been on Edward's side. But when the dispensers grab a chunk of his turf and the king does nothing, Mortimer turns on him and leads a popular uprising against the dispensers and the king. <laughs> Mortimer's men kick the dispensers out of Wales. Then they march on London. Mortimer demands that the dispensers are banished, and that puts Edward in a hopeless position. The king cannot be seen to back down, so he has to refuse. But with Mortimer's army ready to sack London, his refusal could easily get him killed. Salvation comes from an unlikely source. No longer a helpless child, 25-year-old Queen Isabella falls to her knees in front of the court and begs Edward to reconsider for her sake. So just as Mortimer demanded, Edward banishes the dispensers, but crucially, he's able to claim he's doing it for his queen. She's given her husband a face-saving way out of a no-win situation, and it finally spurs him into action. With Isabella by his side, the king is finally going to take the fight to his enemies. In October 1321, Queen Isabella makes a surprise stop here at Leeds Castle in Kent, seeking shelter on her way to Canterbury. Leeds Castle is the stronghold of Bartholomew Badlesmere, one of Mortimer's most prominent allies. Unsurprisingly, when she gets to these gates, Badlesmere's men refuse to let her in. Isabella insists it turns nasty, and in the melee that follows, six of her people are killed. Now, clearly, Isabella's got a core of steel, but why would she come to this castle owned by one of her husband's enemies? Well, in reality, this is just a pretext. Isabella's putting her life on the line to give her husband an excuse to start a fight. 
Just days later, Edward turns up with an army and siege engines, and Leeds Castle surrenders. Edward and Isabella look on as 13 of Badlesmere's defenders are executed for resisting. Watching with them are the dispensers, Edward's ruthless enforcers brought back from exile to manage his campaign. Because this is just the start. For the first time in his entire life, Edward has a well thought out strategic plan. With the dispensers secretly recalled and Isabella by his side, he's going to pick off his enemies one by one. First Battlesmere, then Mortimer, and finally the real prize, Lancaster. Edward heads to Wales, picking off Mortimer's allies on the way. The offensive catches Mortimer off guard. Edward quickly captures him and bangs him up in the Tower of London. The momentum is now with the king, but Lancaster has a big army and powerful allies in the north. He'll be a much tougher proposition to take down. Then something extraordinary happens that absolutely no one saw coming. One of Edward's supporters, the Archbishop of York, receives a series of damning letters, and they're here copied into the government archives. The letters are between two Scottish ministers, here you can see the name of one of them, Sir James Douglas. And they refer to an agreement with an English noble who's named as King Arthur. But what he's doing is guaranteeing he won't support any English invasion of Scotland. There's only one person that King Arthur could be, the king's cousin, Thomas of Lancaster. So this is a smoking gun. It's proof that Lancaster's been colluding with the enemy, and that is treason. Ever since Bannockburn, Edward suspected that Lancaster is in bed with the Scots. Now he can prove it. The king immediately publishes the Lancaster letters, then marches his army north. As Edward approaches, Lancaster's support melts away. No one wants to back a traitor. The Earl is captured, fleeing for his life. This is what remains of Lancaster's favourite castle, Pontefract, and it's here that he's brought in chains to face Edward. In a bitter irony, Edward locks him up in a tower that Lancaster had himself built specifically in anticipation of imprisoning the king. The next day, Lancaster's hauled from his tower to face the court. Now, this is the king's big chance to restore the rule of law to England by giving his cousin a fair trial. After all, the evidence is overwhelming. Lancaster has committed treason, and he would be found guilty. But as ever, this is personal. Edward's not interested in justice. He wants what he's always wanted, revenge. Some Lancaster is tried by a jury of his enemies. No defence, no right to speak, and sentenced to death. I'm in. Judicial murder. Exactly what he did to Gaveston. It takes three blows of the sword to kill Lancaster. As the last blow lands on Lancaster's neck, Edward finally has his revenge on the man who killed his friend. But at what price? The King of England has committed the political murder of the country's premier earl, his first cousin, a man with Plantagenet royal blood in his veins. Pandora's box is open, and no one is safe. On the day of Lancaster's execution, six of his supporters follow him to the gallows. Another three are executed the next day. In the months that follow, the executions continue. No trial, no evidence, just the word of the king. 
117 rebels had their lands confiscated and at least 15 others joined Roger Mortimer in the tower. It must look to the whole kingdom like Edward's bloodlust is insatiable, but in reality, behind the scenes, the dispensers are pulling the strings. It's payback time for the humiliation of their exile. Edward makes Hugh Dispenser Jr. Chamberlain of the Royal Household, giving the dispensers complete control of the machinery of government and the country's finances. Soon, all access to Edward has to go through them. The dispenser regime makes them hated right across the kingdom. But the dispensers don't care. The king is now their puppet. And they're not done yet. Two years later, in autumn 1324, war breaks out with France and the dispensers get an opportunity to move on the one person who could still interfere with their control of the king, Queen Isabella. The King of France is Isabella's brother. Technically, she's an enemy alien, and that's how the dispensers no. treat her. On national security grounds, they purge her household of French people, confiscate her lands, and her younger children are ripped from her to be looked after by Dispenser's wife. Edward does nothing to help her. Imagine how Isabella must feel. She's put up with the humiliation of Gaveston. When Edward went after Lancaster, she was right behind him. She even put her own life on the line at Leeds Castle. She'd done everything Edward could have asked of a queen and more, and this is her reward. Edward can't know it, but this is the beginning of the end of his rule. Six months later, Edward and the dispensers are here in Dover. The war with France is going disastrously wrong. The king has no choice but to turn to his wife for help. He sends Isabella to France to negotiate a truce with her brother, King Charles. When Isabella sails for France, she does so knowing the dispensers have her children. And that's why they're pretty confident she'll have to behave. But they've massively underestimated her. Because this is a woman who will one day become known as the She-Wolf. And Edward and the dispensers are about to find out why. In France, Isabella's influence with her brother does the trick. She gets him to agree to a treaty. But there's a catch. The French king demands that Edward comes to France to seal the deal. Edward going to France is something the dispensers simply can't allow. Their control over the country depends on having the king in their clutches. Without him, the whole thing could unravel. In desperation, the dispensers persuade Edward to send a message claiming to be ill. So they must be delighted when the reply comes back, expressing sympathy and saying that, under the circumstances, the French king would be happy to accept the homage of Edward's son, the 12-year-old Prince Edward, instead. Sounds reasonable. So Edward sends the heir to the throne to France, along with a message telling Isabella to return immediately. It's a massive miscalculation. With Prince Edward safely by her side in Paris, here at the French court in the conciergerie, Isabella makes her move, and it's extraordinary. Quelqu'un m'a séparé de mon mari. Un incident de rompre le lien entre nous. Je proteste que je ne reviendrai pas jusqu'à ce qu'on retire l'intrus. Mais en laissant mes robes de mariage, désormais, je porterai mes robes de veuvage et deuil. As far as Isabella is concerned, until the dispensers are gone, her husband is as good as dead. 
Neither the king nor the dispensers had appreciated the danger of losing control of both the queen and the heir to the throne. But with Isabella declared against them, she quickly becomes the focus for opposition. Edward and Hugh might have thought that by snatching her children, they could force her to toe the line. But they've no idea who they're dealing with. Isabella's opposition doesn't stop at speeches. A month later, she's wearing her black robes of mourning. When she meets a rich, powerful and charismatic man who's just escaped from the Tower of London. Roger Mortimer, her husband's bitterest enemy. The attraction is immediate. Within weeks, they're lovers. Even Paris is shocked. Isabella the She-Wolf and Roger Mortimer, sworn enemy of the king. For Edward II, they are a very dangerous combination. In the autumn of 1326, Isabella and Mortimer head back to England with one simple aim, regime change. D-Day, September the 24th, 1326. And even with Mortimer by her side, for Isabella, this is a hell of a gamble. I mean, let's face it, she's an adulterous foreign queen with an escaped convict lover, backed by a handful of men closer in number to a moderate house party than a proper invasion force. This has all the hallmarks of a suicide mission. But Isabella and Mortimer have called it right. Popular hatred of the dispensers and the king is so deep and so widespread that as his wife and her lover ride through the shires, supporters flock to their side. In less than a month, the queen takes the country. The king is forced to flee for his life. Edward's running out of options fast. He's supposed to be the anointed king of England, but now he's reduced to a man on the run. His only remaining supporter is a man who, if it's possible, is hated even more than he is. Instead, he tried to get a message to Isabella. If only they could talk, maybe they could smooth things over. The time for talking is long gone, but as usual, Edward can't see it. Edward and Hugh are captured, running scared on a forest path in the Welsh mountains. Isabella bangs Edward up in Kenilworth Castle. She hasn't decided what to do with him yet. But she's got big plans for Hugh Dispenser. Dispenser Senior has already been beheaded and fed to the dogs. And he's a lucky one. When Hugh the Younger arrives here in Hereford and sees a 50-foot gallows being erected over the town, he probably begins to suspect the trial he's about to receive isn't going to be entirely fair. And he's right. Like Gaveston and Lancaster before him, he's not allowed to speak in his own defence, and he's tried by people who hate him. And the sentence he receives is so spectacularly vicious and inhuman, he actually tries to starve himself to death just to avoid it. In front of a huge crowd, Dispenser is hung almost to the point of death. But he's not getting off that lightly, because Isabella has a point to prove. This is a very personal execution and a very public statement. 
Isabella has a ringside seat as Dispenser is strapped to a ladder for the next part of his ordeal. The Queen wants everyone to know that Dispenser has come between her and her husband. He's damaged her marriage, and this is her revenge. Dispenser's genitals are cut off. And burned in front of him. Incredibly, Isabella is eating as she watches it happen. Even more incredibly, throughout all of this, Hugh Dispenser never makes a sound. But Isabella isn't done. Dispenser's entrails are pulled out and shown to him. Then he screams. Finally, almost mercifully, he's beheaded. Murderous personal vindictiveness has become the defining characteristic of Edward II's reign. The only person who could have stopped it was Edward. Instead, he embraced it. Now it's coming for him. Edward, who's being held here at Kenilworth Castle, is Isabella and Mortimer's last remaining problem. He may be a defeated tyrant, but he's still the rightful King of England, anointed by God. On the other hand, they've been so blatant about their adultery, they can hardly just give him his crown back. So Edward's wife and her lover have him declared incorrigible and he's deposed by Act of Parliament. Once King of England, he's now just plain Edward of Carnarvon, the place of his birth. For the first time since the Dark Ages, a reigning monarch has been forced from the throne. England has a new king, Edward III, but it's Isabella as regent who's really snatched the crown. The she-wolf, has earned her name. This is Berkeley Castle in Gloucestershire, and it's here the end game is played out. Whilst he's still alive, the king remains a threat. There have already been three attempts to spring him from prison and restore him to power. In truth, he's been a dead man walking since his wife snatched the throne. Publicly, it will be claimed that Edward has died of natural causes, but as news of his death spreads, suspicion of murder grows. The story we're told is that he's tortured and murdered by having a red-hot poker inserted via a trumpet device placed in his rectum. Even after everything Edward had done, how could a king be tortured and killed in such a horrific fashion? The answer, of course, he wasn't. This is the room where Edward II was murdered. Not killed with a poker, but most probably smothered in his bed. <laughs> the poker story only came about about 60 years after Edward was killed, but it's become the standard version. And that's because the idea of a humiliated, emasculated, possibly homosexual king being buggered to death is too good a story to be troubled by the truth. <laughs> Next time, the Plantagenet story reaches its catastrophic climax as Richard II, the boy king who crushed the Peasants' Revolt, turns monstrous tyrant and Henry Bolingbroke rises up to bring the whole dynasty crashing down. <laughs>